I did. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So, welcome to the this new session on the fintech track. Um, now we have. Alex Milakovic, who does not need an introduction, and he will guide us through the modularizing of Finerat. Yes. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. So let's see if this works here. So, hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Ten minutes. Um, actually, for me, not too bad. Um, for those who don't mo know me, maybe a little bit about myself. Um, I pick tier three pictures. I like to travel, but I like more to live in different places. <laughs> so I'm originally from Germany, from Bavaria, which you can see with the beer. This is Munich, very nice place, Chinese tower. You should go one day if you have the chance. I lived for a long time in Lisbon. And uh, right now I live in, uh, live in Eastern Europe, in Belgrade, in Serbia. And um, not by coincidence, my parents are from there. And um, try to contribute to Finneract with frequent power outages. <laughs> um, I'm also the uh, release manager of Finneract for the past uh, two years or so. Um, especially interesting uh, since we crossed the line with uh, versions 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 uh, where we had major contributions. Um, we started um, to actually do patch releases. Um, we introduced SLAs, and we are giving certain guarantees that we are supporting versions um, up to three minor versions back. And uh, the people who know me <laughs> know that I'm getting excited when I see uh, certain decisions made in code, and I do not agree, so I'm opinionated. And that's uh, what we are going to talk today a little bit. Um, Finrakt started out as a monolithic code base. So it was a, like an all batteries included uh, solution. You heard in different talks today, the background of Finneract. Um, Ed had a nice overview um, what the capabilities are. So I'm glossing all over that because it's not really interesting for the, um, for the talk here. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the motivation why we should modularize. Um, I'm showing a little bit the architecture of Finrak, just as a reminder for those that don't work with it every day. Um, I'm going to show a couple of the challenges and um, how we can or we already do address them. Um, the one thing that is close to my heart is uh, a concept that we introduced fairly recently um, that I called custom modules. I'm not very creative, so there might be a better way, uh, name for that, but um, it is what it is. Um, I will explain later. And a little bit of an outlook that might be related to modules, but also tangents on that, right? Just to give a little bit of an impression what's going to happen, hopefully soon. So, why should we bother about uh, modules? Um, the last year, two years, we had really an increased inflow of uh, contributions um, compared to prior um, versions that we created. It's like uh, order, order of magnitude, so nothing compared. We had, um, this year we are a little bit slow, but that is uh, due to me being a bottleneck a little bit. 
and having other di distractions. But we could easily create every year four different um, releases. And uh, two years ago, I think we actually did, or at least we are. We had in one year three releases, and then close to the year another release, so practically four. And in previous years, we had um, pretty much one major release per year. So that was quite a difference. Um, we have a diverse community. We have uh, systems integrators that do sometimes heavy customizations based on uh, FinRAC, depending on the requirements of their customers. There are some challenges there with the development process. Developer experience was at one point not that stellar with um, uh, FINRAC. I'll, I'll explain how that works then into the module concept and then into this topic. Um, we have a lot of stakeholders. Um, so a stable code base is something that we actually want. Um, modules can help with that. And, um, and then finally, um, there is um, this thing with uh, customization. So we had, um, or the community had a certain approach to that. We didn't give really guidelines. And the monolithic code base um, was a little bit in the way there um, to do this in a, what I call a proper way. So again, it's very opinionated. And, um, we have also testing, actually. That is monolithic. <laughs> so um, that is in so far important because um, because the way how we created the tests, um, the tests run very long, right? So um, there is an opportunity if we split this up in a certain way um, that we can have um, faster feedback uh, loops. So I, this is not a scientific approach. I didn't collect data, right? So it's a little bit of a lie, but it reflects probably um, reality to a certain extent. Um, I, I said we had have now, um, I would say the, the community grew quite a bit. And the whole idea with being an Apache project, uh, community over code, so community collaboration, that is a topic that we have to serve. And uh, with a monolithic code base, um, there's a little bit of a challenge here. Um, because uh, it's very easy um, that um, you step on each other's toes, right? Because there is no demarcation line. Pretty much everything is available at the same time and uh, to everyone. And um, so this doesn't really help. In the beginning, when, when FINRAC started, so I was not part of that. I joined somewhere in the middle. Um, that was probably a, a, a good strategy because uh, you could um, do very fast iterations, right? Um, probably not that many people were involved in the, in the development. So um, the communication was faster, so that's not the problem. Now when you have uh, people in different time zones, and uh, with different stakeholders, with different requirements, that's maybe not so ideal. So there's a little bit of an overhead when you introduce modularity in a system. Obviously, if you have everything available in one source folder, that's very easy, right? Um, but that overhead becomes less significant or actually an advantage um, when you move on with your project, when you add more features, um, when you have more um, people contributing, and um, you get the, actually ahead of the curve, right? And the monolithic code base uh, will slow you down. So just that as a visualization a little bit. So the question now is, um, what do we do or what can we do? Because we also have this, um, how should I call it? 
a promise to the community not to upset them. <laughs> so there are, lit, there are a lot of uh, people who are heavily invested in the way how Finract actually works. Um, we had a separate um, effort that was called Finract Cien, uh, that was supposed to be a rewrite from the ground up. Um, that was all nice and well. Um, but what we were lacking was actually functionality. So the community never moved in that direction because the features count. If it's uh, five seconds uh, slower than potentially uh, a new system, then this doesn't really matter, right? And um, because so many peop uh, people are invested uh, in the way that uh, the application is now written, we have to be a little bit careful not to um, be too revolutionary here. Um, a couple of years ago, because I get bored of my mind sometimes, <laughs> I uh, started a bulldozer session, I call it like that, and just went bananas with the source code and just started where I wanted and refactored it very aggressively. Uh, this would have never been accepted as a pull request. Um, it went to a point where I got stuck. So because my premise was also, let's see what we can do here without um, uh, of introducing um, too many um, incompatible changes. And um, so that was a little bit of a dead end. But still, we, we need to address this, uh, this problem with the lack of modularity in, in Finract. Um, one thing that popped up a couple of years ago when we moved to the Apache um, Foundation um, was uh, the reporting engine. So people would be using that, well, some in the community. The problem with that was that um, the reporting engine was based on a library that is GPL licensed. So that is a complete no-go. And so we factored this out of, um, of Finderact itself. And uh, this became actually our first module. And um, because now people can use this um, separate jar file, and uh, we modified uh, Finderact's data parameters to uh, the effect that there's a Matic folder where you can drop in these uh, jar files and it would just um, accept this uh, reporting engine as part of Finnerac, right? So um, that opened the door actually to write another reporting engine that we could deliver with our releases. Um, I still have that on my radar. Um, I'll put this in the outlook, right? Um, didn't happen uh, so far. Um, but just to say, um, the, if you look at the source code of uh, Finneract, um, the package structure is actually really nicely organized. Um, so the choice that I think we have is um, overall, we could look at the application as a monolith, but internally we can organize the features and thinking of them as modules. So, and then I found this, um, so there's this Spring project, uh, it's called Spring Modolith. So, obviously a combination of monolith and modular, right? So, um, it's actually really great. And um, I'll show you why in a, in a moment. Um, just shortly, a reminder of the, the overall architecture of um, Finneract. I'm probably missing a couple of boxes here. It's just a simplification. So we have a REST API layer, right? Uh, traditionally, we started out with JAX-RS, right? An enterprise, uh, uh, Java enterprise library. Um, we still use that. Um, at one point, we had a little bit of difficulties because we were stuck in an older version. So we overcame all these, uh, these issues. Um, the one thing that needs to be noted and that actually has an effect on the modularity is um, that we do manual JSON parsing, right? So you would expect from a modern application 
uh, based on Spring Boot that you would just configure Jackson and Jackson does its way, right? So we have a couple of irregular structures that are not uh, straightforward to pass for a JSON parser. Um, there are now nice APIs, so serializer and deserializer helper classes that you could add. Um, at the time that this didn't exist when um, uh, Finrec was initiated, so manual parsing, this is like a major construction site. Um, in terms of uh, architecture, it's uh, worth mentioning that we kind of have a CQRS concept uh, implemented in the application. So there's a separation between read requests and uh, data modifying uh, requests. Um, we, or some colleagues added recently the ability to scale independently such instances. You could define a, a Finrect instance as a write instance and or as a read instance. So that was a nice feature. And then finally, we have um, our business logic in service classes. So that is simply annotated with um, Spring uh, at service annotations, right? And um, traditionally, we um, used uh, JPA as our storage uh, layer. Um, we had a couple of uh, bumpers al along the road. Uh, so we used uh, initially Hibernate, which was very nice, but uh, again, a problem when you move to the Apache Foundation. Um, so we used a sister project that was called uh, OpenJPA. Um, unfortunately, not very well maintained and with some um, performance issues. And finally, um, since we got these um, major contributions, um, someone took the task and brought us to uh, Eclipse Link, which is really a nice solution. Um, in the meanwhile, due to some performance bottlenecks, um, people started also to just write plain SQL statements, which was for a while a little bit of an issue um, because um, they would use then like any database functions that they could find. Uh, we are traditionally a MySQL application. And uh, obviously that was a little bit of a problem when you want to move to a different system. That was also tackled in the last uh, two years. So we support officially now um, Postgres, which was asked for a lot. Right? But it took a little bit of work to clean this up. And then overall, um, we have a pretty classic uh, layered architecture with uh, some exceptions. I'll come to that in a moment. And um, uh, you have to know maybe that um, all calls are synchronous, except for some improvements where they are not, right? So maybe someone heard yesterday um, this talk about business notifications. So that uh, thing is really nice and asynchronous, um, but um, most of the uh, features are just synchronous, right? The client connects and waits until he gets uh, results. So um, I said already, we have a monolithic code base. We have well-defined package stru uh, structure. Um, we have a lot of cross dependencies between those features because um, people had like all the code in front of them. So it's very tempting to see maybe someone created a utility class or function in a different package completely unrelated to the thing that he's currently working on, and just reused it. And um, so that kind of works, right? So the compiler accepts all that. But it creates like interdependencies between these features, and sometimes they are not really needed, right? Um, so I'll speak about that a little bit when I come to the technical debt with, that we have. Um, but um, this really doesn't help. Um, 
Again, what we also have is some real modules. Uh, I said already the reporting engine out of necessity. So that is a, even a nice module in so far that it's a separate jar file. We are not even like pretending that it's modular, right? So with this monolithic application and modular features concept. So it's, it's a real uh, independent module. Um, another one that we added is um, the Finderact client, the Finderact API client. So we have a lot of integrations based on uh, Finderact and people would like start from scratch um, writing their own HTTP clients to communicate with our REST API. Um, we had um, fairly old documentation uh, written in a static HTML file that was very extensive actually and very useful uh, for a long time to a lot of people, uh, but not very well maintained. Uh, so the API evolved, uh, that HTML document didn't, but it was, it was still used uh, for a long time as a reference. And people would then just recreate some kind of piece of code to communicate with Finerac. So uh, we said we should standardize that. A couple of years ago, in a Google Summer of Code project, we added um, an open API descriptor to um, make our uh, REST API machine readable. And um, a little bit later, we added also a, a code generator, right? So the open API code generator and made it a separate uh, um, library that we don't publish yet in a public Maven repository, but we should. Right? And um, an official part of this code generation is um, also that we are creating a TypeScript client because we also have a web user interface, which is not under the Apache umbrella, but under Mifos. Um, but uh, the web UI also has this um, issue that there's a lot of handcrafted code and um, to communicate with the backend. <coughs> and obviously that poses a little bit of a problem. Uh, people were asking then which version of the user interface uh, is still compatible with which version of, um, of Fineract. And like this, there are no questions. And so you use a certain version of a client and then that's that. Um, recently, there were some efforts um, to reorganize the code. Um, we had um, one main build module, like Gradle module in the repository that contained that monolithic code base. And um, uh, some uh, colleagues um, tried to detangle this a little bit, so to create something like a core module, um, maybe another, I think, uh, what was it, lending, a loan, something like that, um, is a separate module. But there's still a little bit of a problem. Like technically, when you look at this, um, there are still some interdependencies um, that need to be solved. So where are these modules? Um, you can find them actually in basically two folders. Um, there's an infrastructure uh, folder and the portfolio folder. Um, this is where most of them live. Um, above them, I call it this top level for the lack of another word. Um, there are a couple of more. Question is um, if we should rearrange that a little bit. Um, I'll come to that in, in a moment with the technical debt. And um, because uh, just to give an example, um, the word account is very popular in that code base. So there's savings account, there's account, there's accounting, right? Uh, just to probably there's one or two more uh, that are related to account. And um, uh, that makes it uh, hard, for example, for new newbies um, to, to get into this. Uh, you have to really um, know uh, what they were meant for, right? And um, it con uh, creates also a couple of um, problems. Um, 
how does a, a module look like? So when I say module, uh, you have to think of this like a package. And under that package, there are some sub packages, right? So one of these red boxes is a package under a folder. And um, so we are uh, fairly um, disciplined uh, with that over the years. Um, so there is an API package, data package. So API would contain all these REST resource classes, um, basically our entry points, right? So for the API. Uh, then we have this um, data package, which is um, kind of data transfer objects, right? Um, we have these service uh, interfaces and implementations um, that contain mostly business logic. Um, we have uh, domain classes that are the mapping between the database and, and the Java world. And then we have finally repositories to interact with the storage layer. So um, the left side kind of displays how this was intended. And then the right side is uh, the reality. So especially um, when it comes uh, to uh, mapping the JSON uh, um, data that we receive from the outside world um, to uh, Java, this is where things get a little bit complicated. I told you that we are doing the JSON serialization, deserialization in a manual fashion with uh, the JSON library from Google. And um, this got so tedious at one point that people decided, let's skip this, uh, let's skip this uh, step. And this is uh, like you can see, uh, in the other layers, we are still fairly uh, disciplined, but that um, uh, data layer, that is really an issue. So and people skipped that and just said, let's pass the JSON data directly to the service layer. So now we create a situation where your business logic is aware how we communicate with the system. If you would, for example, decide tomorrow we use a binary protocol or gRPC or pigeons to communicate with Finrac. We can't because the service, uh, so the business logic layer is actually uh, fully aware how we communicate. And um, we have like um, a ton of, of code that just deals with um, uh, um, very dull stuff, just translating, uh, extracting data, right? And then on top of this, uh, so on the left side, I had one repository block. In fact, we have two of those now because we have two different technologies. Um, we have JPA and the handcrafted SQL. Um, in some private discussions, I, I was um, suggesting that maybe we uh, skip JPA completely and use something that gives us um, the database independence, but the full potential of direct SQL statements. Uh, a way to get there would be, for example, using query DSL or I never know how to pronounce that project, uh, JOQ, right? very nice libraries where you get basically um, type safe uh, SQL query generation, right? So the challenges. Um, if you look at the source code, um, then very often the decision for a feature or a module, however you call it, was based on um, the data so people would think loan, right? So there was a loan class. And then this would be pretty much the demarcation line for that, um, for that feature. But maybe sometimes that's not so easy. And so there, there's one example. Um, we have a lot of user data uh, information associated to those um, to those entities, um, so be it loan or client or whatever, 
we have there. Um, I, I was not involved in the decision uh, why this was made, but I, I'm suspecting it was driven by the user interface. So when you display a loan, you want to know who approved it, uh, who is the, the one who took the loan, right? And obviously, you don't want to see the user ID. Um, you want to see first name and last name. <coughs> and um, so we have, like, on the database level, a lot of joints to this user table. And, um, uh, but that crosses boundaries, right? So user is one thing that belongs more in the domain of security, and loan is another thing. Technically, we could live with loans that just have user IDs. If I want to display it in a, in a, a user interface, that's in a different problem. So I have to solve this at one point, right? But I could write code for that. I don't necessarily need it to keep that information. And then I said um, uh, we have these interdependencies between the, uh, the features or the modules, right? We have some technical debt. Um, when I say technical debt, it seems to be un unrelated sometimes, but uh, <laughs> my go-to um, example is always the loan entity class. So the Java class that we are mapping to the loan table, it contains 7,000 lines of code. So a class like that um, should only contain class attributes and a couple of getters and setters, nothing else. Uh, there's nothing else to do there. What happened over time, in fact, is that um, we started to bury um, business logic in that class, which was a very uh, controversial, let's say, uh, decision. And um, because we have these 7,000 lines of code, it doesn't really matter what's happening inside or if it's only utility functions or whatnot. Um, um, this makes life a lot uh, harder than to detangle things. I remember at one point uh, someone created uh, utility functions that handled uh, date conversions, for example. Right? So obviously something generic as that is uh, appealing to basically any other um, module that we have. We have everywhere some kind of date representation. And then people started to use that. Right? <laughs> Um, so that uh, technical debt actually is one of the reasons why these interdependencies uh, are happening. So I told you that uh, testing is uh, also like a monolithic code base in the end. Um, we have a lot of tests, like 900 and something or so, uh, 40 I want to say. Um, doesn't really matter, it's like a ton load. Um, we were very uh, disciplined in... Um, Feature created, test created, bug fixed, bug uh, tested. So that's all good. But um, the way that we created it, we are only able to execute uh, the tests in, in Syria. So the feedback loop to see if I broke anything is one hour or plus at the moment. So obviously, the, the developers are reluctant to do this on uh, their machines, right? So they push um, the code and let uh, GitHub Actions do that. And then it fails, and then you have another cycle, and I, yes, I have this under control, but no. Right? And um, another thing is, so we are looking always at uh, the Java code, but there is also a different layer, right? So the database layer. And um, sometimes, um, especially when people started um, uh, uh, creating these handcrafted SQL statements, they just said, well, I am in module loan, but I have this data from a different module. They don't, we're not really thinking about that. So I can do a join, right? On the database level, uh, nothing uh, says no against that. The compiler still uh, accepts your code. Um, there's no check that we can apply to say, don't do that. Right? And um, so data isolation is actually a problem. 
And then, uh, you know, at one point we were thinking, uh, should we then immediately create jar files and publish them to um, uh, Maven Central? That would be the ideal case. Um, uh, but um, as I said, for some modules that we have, like the FINRA client, um, the uh, uh, reporting engines, we can do that already. Uh, for the rest, maybe it's a little bit too ambitious at this, at this point. Um, I was already talking about, uh, about boundaries. I'll, I'll skip that. Just to show you a little bit of a visual representation, this is, uh, this is the code base. Right? So you have some hot spots there. Right? Uh, it's far too small uh, to read what it actually is. It doesn't really matter. It, it's just, uh, you know, to give an impression, some of these hotspots are probably the user table, right? That is used pretty much everywhere. And um, over time, maybe we have to see if we can detangle this or at least for new features that we add to pay more attention to look at the domain boundaries that we are defining there. And, and try to make them as independent as possible. Right? So there's a suggestion with uh, a new accounting module, for example. Maybe we can um, leave out the reference to user data. Just a suggestion. <laughs> right, so there's a little bit of a hierarchy here for data isolation. Um, uh, this uh, goes from none uh, existing right to very strict. Um, I don't think that we will ever reach very strict, um, but just to say where the uh, red demarcation line is, above that, we have combinations of all of that. Right? So, um, not sure um, how we can address that or, or if we should address this, but at least, you know, just to give an idea for, for new stuff that we add maybe to include this as a rule when we design new features. Um, one thing that is close to my heart is custom modules because I kind of was involved here. Um, <laughs> this is now um, like a suggestion how um, uh, people who do integrations that happen outside of the community and stuff that can't be donated back to um, uh, the project, um, can still create a fork of a Finderact and um, don't shoot themselves. When I say don't shoot themselves, uh, so let's say th there's a requirement for a certain loan product and it's not really um, available with, um, with Finderact. Maybe it's available as 80% uh, of the feature set. Right? And then these 20%, somehow we have to bring this into the mix. And um, uh, what people then did is they used the original uh, uh, code right, and just did in situ changes. So that works for the first week. And if it's like a significant change, the se second week, I can guarantee it's a complete nightmare. Um, it's... Uh, becomes basically impossible to um, avoid any git, git conflicts and to resolve them on top of that. Maybe you, you'll survive one, one round of that. Uh, the second round, no. So people get stuck with a certain version of uh, Finneract. Um, there's no possibility basically to bring in bug fixes and whatnot. And which is more important for the project itself, it's impossible to bring something back. Because everyone who develops a customization comes across like the other odd uh, bug that is not really relevant to any secret source of a customer, could be easily uh, uh, brought back uh, to, to us upstream, but they can't <laughs> because everything is in the same place. So what we suggested is to have these uh, customizations in the physically separated place it's a separate folder where we guarantee nothing from the upstream project will ever materialize in that uh, folder. And I added a little bit of um, uh, convenience to um, actually make this happen. So people, for example, don't have to create build Gradle files and whatnot. All the dependencies are automatically um, 
uh, uh, provided to those uh, customizations, what you actually only have to do is um, create a folder. And you can decide for yourself if it's just one folder. I would suggest the first folder that you create is kind of a namespace, right? So the name of the company or the client uh, for which you are creating that customization. And then under that, you can decide whatever you want to do. I said maximum of uh, three folders down. In each of these folder levels, you can create source, main, Java, right? So it will be accepted by IntelliJ immediately, just reloading, and you can immediately start working. <coughs> this includes also um, the possibility to add your own uh, liquid-based uh, change scripts. Right? Uh, so that is already used in, in production. Um, I added um, examples how to do auto-configuration, for example how to load your modules automatically. And um, there's also a custom Docker build that will include any of those custom modules in a separate uh, Docker image. So it doesn't know how you decide to do your um, customization, how to create that, but it will pick up any of the uh, generated jar files automatically. Right? And um, again, no changes from upstream are expected, except for some um, examples how to uh, do this. Um, one thing that is uh, important to know here is, um, and the student is currently working on that, um, you know that in, in those feature packages, um, we have these add service annotations. So everything, so all these business logic uh, implementations are automatically loaded um, on when Finrak boots. So when you want to provide an alternative to the original implementation, that's kind of a uh, bummer. So what we did is um, we removed those annotations and added instead a, a Java configuration with a conditional uh, loading of the default implementation. So unless there is no alternative provided for a certain service interface, it will load the default, right? Like this, you can uh, create on those custom modules, you can basically pre uh, uh, replace uh, Finnerak in entirely, right? Or you can extend from the original implementation and just overwrite one function that uh, you don't agree with. So, and... Um, at one point, we have to break eggs um, to, to make some nice omelets, right? So right now, it's not the, not the time. Um, so that's why we have this compromise with the monolithic application and internally um, these uh, uh, modules, uh, features uh, as modules. Um, uh, but a little bit of an outlook. Um, so I'm currently working on uh, um, modular rising security. Uh, we have this baked into um, Finneract. Um, it's kind of an opinionated approach. It's uh, spring security, which is good. Um, but we have um, basically all the um, uh, permission uh, information and roles and whatnot inside of the database. So there are different approaches uh, to that. Um, and um, also there's this user table with um, passwords and whatnot. Right? And I'm working currently to, first of all, um, make this a proper OAuth um, instance with a Spring authorization server. So uh, Finract itself will it be its own ID server. Um, after that, uh, we'll have support for external um, servers like Keycloak, for example. That will be probably like a example, right? But any uh, OAuth compliant uh, server will do. Um, as I said, um, replaceable services that is being worked on, probably not part of the next release, but the release after for sure. Um, there are some um, internals uh, that are being worked on. Um, actually, um, one other strategy to um, solve this, this module problem that we have is actually to remove them. So there's one, <laughs> one module that we have it's kind of an infrastructure module for configuration. This is basically a hash map that is uh, saved in the database. 
We use this for um, not really critical stuff like SMS campaigns, document management, um, uh, what was it else, doesn't really matter. And um, the, the thing is, nowadays we should do this in the configuration, right? So there are like really great solutions for reloading configuration in the Kubernetes context. And, and uh, this um, burying stuff in the database doesn't really help. So another thing is tenant configuration that is also in the database should be in file that is being worked on. I uh, uh, said something about the report engine. And then one thing that uh, we should really uh, mention is um, somewhere down the road, I'm not sure, but it's not going to be long term. It's at the longest midterm, we should enforce certain rules in terms of the architecture. There are nice um, tools to do that. So one is ArcUnit, for example. And we should add this and treat it like uh, failing tests. Right. And that's it. Thank you. You can ask me outside.